and it's 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 like it's in, like when you talk about style as a writer, when you talk about a prose style, um, there's not there's actually nothing mysterious about it. Your prose style is merely a very direct projection of your personality. Um, it's kind of the most direct projection that's 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 um, possible, really. Um, you can't hide from your personality on the page as a, as a writer it kind of it all comes out <laughs> on the page you know and after a certain period and life has passed you tend to uh, not really there's not much you can do about your personality you just have to kind of go with it on the page you know um my personality is kind of about 95 percent made up of kind of nervous hysteria <laughs> and mad energy and I just have to go with that on the page sometimes I start writing a short story and think I'd love to write a really quiet uh, thoughtful story in in prose that's clear as glass you know uh, but it's just not me you know uh, the prose immediately starts jumping up and down on the page looking for attention like an hysterical jazz dancing child <laughs> you know it's um you just have to go with it and I think I, when writers are trying to um when you when you hear that a writer is trying to find her voice or trying to find his voice really all you're hearing there is that the person is trying to figure out who they are and let, and let that come true on the page um it all shows up in fiction you know it's easier to lie um in an essay or in a piece of non-fiction than it is in when you when you make it up on the page everything comes out all the weird murky stuff from your subconscious comes out in your in your fiction um it's because you don't write creatively you don't write drama or stories or novels at the front of your brain you're you, you you're using the back of your brain you're using your subconscious places um the only thing that writing is close to in life is dreaming it, it, it comes from the same place um it's really interesting to think of how good we all are at storytelling when we dream um these incredible scenes just naturally present themselves this dialogue that you couldn't make up um the the dreams flow along with their own kind of narrative kind of coherence somehow um and then we wake up in the morning and we can't do it you know we we, we get too self-conscious about it um is this one of the reasons why i and then in common with a lot of writers like to write first thing in the morning when i'm still kind of half asleep because there's still a sense that you have access to those kind of murky weird oily subconscious places um and you can get some of it down on the page um but it but i i do believe strongly that that writing is 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 very close to dreaming in in, in the part of the, the the in the part of your brain you're working with i do think um i mean as a reader like and most readers i like a book that has what I call thumb, you know, in that, that you're compulsively want to turn the pages and, and, and move it along. Um, in terms of trying to get that propulsion on the page in my own work, given that I often kind of go for it on the language level, um, and language can slow um, the page down dramatically for the reader if, 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 if it's considered difficult. I mean, I guess I use my ear a great deal in, in, in my, my practice of writing fiction, as in I read the stuff aloud a lot, um, especially when it comes to what feels like, say, the penultimate draft of a story or a novel, when it's kind of getting there, but not quite. I will then read the script aloud with editing pen in hand um, because your ear is a much better tool um, than your eye for the writing. You can happily kind of glaze over stuff on a computer screen or on a page and think, oh, this is this is fine. But as soon as you read it aloud and as soon as you hear it on the air, you find the little notes that are off and the little places where there are evasions. Um, and and it, it tells you so much. Um, I would strongly encourage anyone to who's not in the practice of doing it um, to frequently read their work aloud and to hear out sounds. I think it gives you so much in terms of getting propulsion on the page, getting rhythm right the rhythm of the prose is what it dictates the speed it's going to be consumed essentially um and how it's going to be enjoyed and if it's going to linger for the reader or not um it's all kind of mysterious stuff that you do by instinct but i my theory is that the ear is the most useful tool for it um just to go back to your quote uh, from kelly link about kind of nocturnal kind of 
energies and so forth coming into the writing. I do, I do think it's very interesting. I have lots of friends who are, who are visual artists and I have noticed that they're much more inclined to kind of question their own practice than writers are. Writers can have a tendency to get s- stuck in their ways. Um, whereas visual artists in, 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 in my experience are often trying to change the, the way they work and looking at their practice in different ways. And it's definitely the case that you're a different writer at different times of the day and night. Um, with the most recent novel, Night Boat to Tangier, um, I was, I was, um, it was quite quick for me. It was very intense, just under a year. Um, the book took and I was enjoying it from the start, but it, I, I, and often it's the case when I'm in a seriously involved in a project, my, my sleeping wasn't great. Like lots of writers, I have insomniac periods when I'm in the thick of a book. And um, I was actually sleeping so badly, I thought, you know what, fuck this, I'm actually going to work at night. I, I, I'm not sleeping anyway, so I'm going to change my practice. And instead of being a morning worker, I'm going to stay up. And I, I, I did so. I, I, my wife would go to bed about 11 with her book and, and, her, and her cup of herbal tea, and I, I would go to work and I would work till four or five in the morning um, in the swamp in the in the northwest of Ireland um, with, with lo- a log fire going in the stove and and, 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 and some soft lamps and, and some, some sort of cello music going. Um, I was really going for it on the atmosphere front, you know, and it definitely gave a different um, texture to the novel. It gave it a kind of a a kind of a more nocturnal, more somber feeling, I think. It gave it a kind of a, a different energy and it made me um, realize that there's, there's a lot to be looked at in terms of practice for a writer in, that, in the ways that you can mix it up. If you write every book in the same way, there's the danger that you're gonna keep writing the same book over and over and the same story over and over, the same poem over and over. So to, just to try and change it and try to mix it up as much as possible. Um, it's also really interesting um, how working in, in, in one form of writing can influence you in other ways. Um, this is something I've found over the years because I write in lots of different, I write stage plays and screenplays and kind of essays and then nonfiction pieces as well as novels and short stories. And it, it, it'd be really interesting the way working in one place will improve you in a, in a, in a very kind of distinct uh, form. For, for example, I had a project for a while that never came to fruition. But with an artist friend, we were working on a graphic novel. Um, I was doing the words and my friend Ali was doing the pictures, the drawings. And just looking at the way Ali drew a story um, taught me an awful lot, I think, about the, 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 the art of writing a short story. Uh, taught me about how much of the scaffolding that you can take away and how much of the fun of it is in finding out what you can remove and what you can take away. And still the, the contraption is, is working and uh, it's, kind of like watchmaking, you know, but it's um, it's a very interesting thing, I think, for emerging writers to mix up their forms and genres often and as much as they can, because it, it's, you know, try and try and write, write, a, write a Western or a, a space opera for, for the stage and, and muscles you never knew you had will, will, will show themselves. What happens actually with me often is, is um, because I write in different forms, I'm not sure exactly what the project is going to be at the start. I did have these two kind of fading gangster figures called Morris and Charlie um, from the city of Cork in Ireland. So they would have very particular soft Cork, uh, Cork city accents. And they, they, they were a very funny pair who kept trying to elbow their way into short stories and would show up in, in this draft of a play or something um, as kind of side characters, as this kind of pair of kind of wry, long-suffering, wise-cracking old dope importers from the south of Ireland. Um, and I eventually, they were shown up so much in an, in, in an annoying way, I decided, oh, I have to give them their own thing. I have to actually write their story and figure out who these two guys are. And I started to write it as a stage play, but it very quickly became evident that the thing wanted to become a novel. It kept opening out into backstory, and we had, we had to figure out how they got to be in this place where we find them. So, so this... The novel opens at the port of Algeciras in the south of Spain. Um, Morris's daughter, Dilly, a teenager, has been missing for a few years. She's, she's run off to Spain um, and they, they believe she may be about to pass through the very terminal in Algeciras. Um, so chapter one is titled The Girls and the Dogs at the Port of Algeciras in October 2018. 
Would you say there's any end in sight, Charlie? I'd say you nearly have an answer to that question already, Morris. Two Irishmen, sombre, in the dank light of the terminal, make gestures of long sufferance and woe. They are born to such gestures and offer them easily. It is night in the old Spanish port of Algeciras. Oh, and this is as awful a place as you could muster. You'd want the eyes sideways in your head. The ferry terminal has a haunted air, a sinister feeling. It reeks of tired bodies and dread. There are scraps of frayed posters, the missing. There are customs announcements, the narco traficante. A blind man roils in night sweat and clicks his teeth to sell lottery tickets like a fat, rattling serpent. He's doing nothing for the place. The Irishman look out blithely at the faces that pass by in a blur of the seven distractions. Love, grief, pain, sentimentality, avarice, lust and want of debt. Above them, a cafe bar reached by escalator hisses with expectancy clinks of life. There's a hatch with a sign marked Information, tell us more, and a small ledge tilts from it questioningly. Morris Hearn and Charlie Redmond sit on a bench just a few yards west of the hatch. They are in their low fifties. Years are rolling out like tide now. There is old weather on their faces, on the hard lines of their jaws, on their chaotic mouths, but they retain just about a rakish air. You want to hop back there, Charlie? Have another word, see about this next boat that's due in. Yeah, but the same lad is still on, Morris, the lad with the bitter face in him. He's not a talker, Moss. Try him, Charlie. Charlie Redmond rises from the bench in a bundle of sighs. He unfolds his long bones. He approaches the hatch. He's lame, and he drags the right peg in a soft brushing motion with practiced ease. He throws his elbows onto the counter. His aura is of brassy menace. He wears a corner boy's grimace. His Spanish pronunciation is very much from the north side of Cork City, Ireland. Hola, buenos noches, he says. He waits it out for a long beat, looks over his shoulder, calls back to Morris. No response, must bitter face on him still. Morris shakes his head sadly. I fucking hate ignorance, he says. Charlie tries again. Hola! Excuse me, trying to find out about this next boat. This boat from Tangier coming in or, or going out. Silence and gesture. Charlie looks back to his friend and mimics the informationista's shrug. All I'm getting here is the shoulders, Morris. Habla inglés is what you say to him, Charlie. But Charlie throws up his hands and shuffles back to the bench. Habla my hole, he says. All he's doing is give me the shoulders, give me the eyes. A face on him, says Morris, like a bad marriage. Mm -hmm.